Welcome to Positive Readings. Today I'm going to continue to look at the work of Kawabata Yasunari. In the previous video I looked at his first major novel, Snow Country. Today I'm going to be looking at Thousand Cranes. Uh, like Snow Country, this novel also has a Japanese uh, traditional cultural theme. In this case it's much more emphasized than Snow Country. Snow Country was looking at the geisha and the shamisen playing, at least that was the um, uh, part of the uh, setting. In this case, we have the traditional tea ceremony. Snow Country was set prior to World War II. Uh, this novel, Thousand Cranes, is set just after World War II, but they have a several discussions or references to uh, the air raids uh, that took place in Tokyo. So this is kind of the, the backdrop of, uh, of this novel. So um, war, World War II, bombing of Tokyo, and then just after the war. Many of the characters in this novel, like uh, in the next novel I'm going to look at, uh, The Sound of the Mountain, are characters who are uh, living in the shadows or uh, living post kind of trauma from, from the war, and these events shape their lives in some way. These characters, while the war isn't so much something that shapes their lives, uh, it's their family instead. Like Snow Country, Thousand Cranes is narrated uh, using a close third person, right up on the, the main character. Uh, our main character is Kikuji. He's a 25-year-old uh, whose parents have re recently passed away, and particularly his father uh, and his father's actions um, really shape really shape Kikuji and uh, the dilemma, the, the conflict uh, in this novel. So uh, the novel is centered around a number of tea ceremonies and uh, Kikuji and other characters essentially trying to live with the consequences of Kikuji's father's extramarital affairs. So uh, there are two women uh, in this novel that were, um, that were the mistresses of Kikuji's father. One of them is Chikako. She's kind of this overly bold, kind of pushy um, spinster, say, who, who, is, who, who kind of runs these, uh, the tea ceremony for a number of other characters. Uh, in this novel. And again, so she's kind of in some way the center, a bit of a villain, uh, though also not fully developed in the sense that Kikuji uh, is developed. And I would say he's the main one that's really developed here. And of course, the, kind of the ghost of his father, the shadow of his father throughout. Uh, the other character, older woman, is Miss Ota. Uh, so that's a more favored mistress of Kikuji's father. And, and then finally, uh, of her, her daughter, uh, Fumiko, uh, who appears like she's going to be the love interest of Kikuji, but that never fully uh, develops. So uh, like I did with Snow Country, I'd like to look at a few passages here that, um, again, we can think of as uh, highlighting some of the themes in this novel, but also uh, ambiguous in, in, in what they might uh, what they might mean and, and how we can go about interpreting them. So the first one I wanted to look at uh, comes at the beginning, and this is in some ways, well, certainly characterizing Chicago, the, the pushy um, spinster who was also running this, um, running, running this tea, tea ceremony. And they talk about how there's a, there's a uh, a flashback, a memory of uh, when Kikuji was a child, he saw this large birthmark on the breast of Kikako, and and later her mother, uh, Kikuji's mother, finds out about this and kind of uh, attributes this to the reason why Chikako cannot get uh, married. Um, but this this birthmark affects. Kikuji in, in a kind of an odd way. It's something that kind of recurs throughout the novel 
uh, at least the reference to it. Chicago appeared to have no children. One could, if one wished, suspect that his father had not allowed her to. The association of birthmark and baby that had saddened his mother might have been his father's device for convincing Chicago that she did not want children. In any case, Chicago produced none, either while Kikuji's father lived or after his death. So a, a little bit of characterization of Kikuji's father. He seems quite controlling, uh, even of his mistress uh, here. And also the reference to the mother, Chikako's mother, sorry, Kikuji's mother, is that uh, she believed that Chikako couldn't have children because of this birthmark of uh, the child would not want to to see this uh, while, while it was breastfeeding. Uh, perhaps Chikako had made her confession so soon after Kikuji had seen the birthmark because she feared that Kikuji himself would tell of it. Chikako did not marry. Had the birthmark then governed her whole life? Kikuji never forgot the mark. He could sometimes imagine even that his own destinies were enmeshed in it. And I think this line here particularly is important. Had the birthmark then governed her whole life? I think the implication is that perhaps it has, but uh, certainly her relationship with Kikuji's father and, um, and also Miss Ota, who, comes, who gets kind of entwined in this, uh, that has governed at least Kikuji's own life. So he's, uh, well, he's not asking this question. The narrator's asking this question, but the question is thematically linked to Kikuji's own problem, that his, these relationships that his father had have carried on into his own life and governed his own life to some extent. The next passage I'd like to look at uh, is the one I've found I remember on my first reading, most shocking and even, even later. So this is, you know, the, this, the novel begins with this tea ceremony. Uh, Chikako, in her typical pushy way, has invited uh, Kikuji there, uh, and she hasn't really told him, or she told him once, once he got there, that she's actually having him there to see this, this woman that possibly he can marry. Now, this sounds maybe a, a bit strange from a Western context, but this would be the, the, the usual way to, uh, tr or traditional way uh, in Japan, to, to organize a marriage. Uh, a, a third party would invite the two people together to kind of view each other. They call this a, uh, a miai. And I, might, I, I could be wrong here, but I think me might even have to do with seeing. So uh, like a visual meeting, I think miai. Uh, so you come, you see the person, and, uh, and then there's, through that third person, there's some discussion and organization of that marriage. So Chikako is trying to kind of, t uh, against Kikuji's will, foist a, a marriage on him, uh, all right? So, so at that ceremony, Kikuji meets his father's other mistress, which is uh, Miss Ota, and they have some discussion, and then there's a, 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 a section break or getting this new section, section four of this first chapter. And this is where it comes in. And I thought this part, like I said, was, was quite, um, quite shocking when I first read it. Uh, surprising, I should say. Maybe that's the better word. Here it is. Miss Ota was at least 45, some 20 years older than Kikuji, but she had made him forget her age when they made love. He felt that he had had a woman younger than he in his arms sharing a happiness that came from the woman's experience. Kikuji felt none of the embarrassed reticence of inexperience. He felt as if he had for the first time known woman, and as if for the first time he had known himself as a man. So the surprising part there is obviously that uh, the son uh, has, has uh, slept with um, his father's old mistress. Uh, made love to her, as, as they, they say here. So, uh, and again, there are many ways that an author could go about describing this. Uh, I think 
I think uh, Kawabata has done it very tastefully. He hasn't really given us any description, and he just kind of told us that. And by telling us that, or, or breaking in right after, like so he doesn't show us any of the, the lead up to this, none of the explanation of how this came together. We just get, you know, post, post-action, post-coitus, so to speak. Uh, and it's surprising that, whoa, we, we didn't see that coming. Uh, we didn't expect that. Uh, it's certainly a bit of an odd thing to happen. Uh, and even stranger is then later after um, Miss Ota dies and uh, Kikuji appears to have a, a, a love interest in her daughter, uh, in, in Miss Ota's daughter, right? Which again, I, is, is quite bizarre. This is just one way uh, that these characters' parents and their, their past actions uh, kind of dictate or influence the, the next generation. And that's really a theme throughout this, uh, this novel, uh, even in the sense of the, remember, remember there's, a lot of the, there's a lot of tea ceremony in this novel, and uh, the tea items themselves are kind of passed on from generation to generation. So even that uh, is, a, is a factor here. So I want, I want to look at how this theme is talked about uh, from another angle. Uh, this is later in the novel when uh, Miss Ota has died and, and Kikuji is meeting with her, her daughter, Fumiko. And let me, I will just read here. It says, uh, It seemed that the dreaminess was here too in the pair of Raku bowls. So again, we're talking about tea bowls here, uh, which again might not appeal to everyone, but I think there's sufficient detail of the characters and their conflict uh, to, to carry this novel, even if you have no interest or very little interest in tea, like myself. It was strange and subtle, the fact that the child, Fumiko, should not know the body from which she had come. And, subtle, and subtly, the body itself had been passed on to the daughter. From the moment she had greeted him in the doorway, Kikuji had felt something soft and gentle. In Fumiko's round, soft face, he saw her mother. If Mrs. Ota had made her mistake when she saw Kikuji's father in Kikuji, then there was something frightening, a bond like a curse, in the fact that to Kikuji, Fumiko resembled her mother. But Kikuji, unprotesting, gave himself to the drift. So. Kikuji seeing Miss Ota in his in her daughter, which is pretty u- normal, right? Uh, children tend to look like one of their parents, uh, at least in some way. Uh, and but the narrator is kind of commenting on that, and maybe the 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 mix of the the sexual attraction there, which again that brings the odd part into this. Uh, Keep in mind, Kawabata was an orphan, so maybe he had detachment issues, perhaps. Um, Either way, I think this is a, an interesting look at how, uh, you know, of, of, of how attraction can become distorted and how we can, and uh, in, in how, how things can get passed on, just like the, 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 t- the, the vessels and the tea ceremony and, uh, and through different generations, there's something in them that we find attractive. The final part that I'd like to look at brings out this this mixing of the tea vessels with the characters uh, a bit more. So this is uh, right near the end of the novel. Um, I'll just read here. It says, a, a man's and a woman's. They're talking about these, these two tea glasses, a, a travel set. You, you have to bring your tea glasses with you. Uh, a man's and a woman's. Kikuji spoke in some confusion. When you see them side by side, Fumiko nodded as if unable to speak. To Kikuji, too, the words had an odd ring. The karatsu, that's the type of teacup. Uh, the, the karatsu was undecorated, greenish with a touch of saffron and a touch, too, of carmine. It swelled powerfully toward the base. We get a lot of these very overly descriptive um, uh, depictions of, of teacups. A favorite your father took with him on trips. It's very much like your father. That's Fumiko speaking. Fumiko seemed not to sense the danger in the remark. 
Kikuji could not bring himself to say that the Shino bowl, another type of bowl, uh, was like her mother, but the two bowls before them were like the souls of his father and her mother. The tea bowls, three or four hundred years old, were sound and healthy, and they called up no morbid thoughts. Life seemed to stretch taut over them, however, in a way that was almost sensual. Seeing his father and Fumiko's mother in the bowls, Kikuji felt that they had raised two beautiful ghosts and placed them side by side. The tea bowls were here, present, and the present reality of Kikuji and Fumiko facing across the bowls seemed immaculate too. So they're having this tea ceremony, and in a sense, they're calling up the souls of their dead parents who had a relationship. Again, it was extramarital. Um, and they're, they're kind of bound by this. And, and that's really what this novel is, is about, how uh, the actions of parents can live on to shape uh, their, their children's um, destinies in some way, uh, in, the, in, a, in a similar way how the tea vessels that get passed on to different people uh, can uh, have, have, an a part, have a part with them. And uh, maybe an interesting companion to this uh, book would be uh, Kakuzo Okakura, I think I'm saying that right, uh, The Book of Tea. Uh, and specifically related to that last part I was just looking at, uh, might be worth looking at uh, his description of what teaism is. Uh, he says, teaism is a cult founded on the adoration of the beautiful among the sordid facts of everyday existence. It inculcates purity and harmony, the mystery of mutual uh, charity, the romanticism of the social order. It is essentially a worship of the imperfect, as it is a tender attempt to accomplish something possible in the impossible thing we know as life. So this idea that uh, teaism is this way of bringing purity into the sordid things of life, the uh, the, the more human element, which, of course, um, Kikuji and his, and, and uh, Miss Ota's uh, daughter know, know, know about well, right? They are kind of the descendants of sordid acts, uh, or uh, at least, you know, w acts that were outside of the norm uh, of, of family and, and culture. And so this tea ceremony perhaps is this time uh, where they can come together and, and kind of bring out some of the, the purity of that. Uh, so again, that, that's coming from the Book of Tea, uh, which is originally written in English. It's a, a very, very readable and interesting book, uh, despite its title. Uh, and it's, it has a lot of uh, comment on philosophy and politics, so well worth the read to accompany Thousand Cranes. Thank you for watching Positive Readings. If you enjoy this video, please like it and subscribe. Reading and writing are choices. Let's make them.